Hello everyone, my name is Natalie. I am the Director of Community Engagement here at NAMI Maine. I'm also an occupational therapist and today I'm here to talk with you about officer stress management. Before I jump into our agenda, I wanted to take a minute to explain who I am and why I'm offering this training to you. So as I said, my name is Natalie and I am an occupational therapist. Um, so for those of you that don't know what occupational therapy is, it's a healthcare profession that supports individuals across the lifespan to fully participate and function in daily activities of importance to them. So those daily activities could be uh, getting dressed, uh, cooking your meals, playing with your kids, um, going to work, doing all of your work-related responsibilities, socializing, um, etc. We work in a variety of settings and we step in when something has interrupted somebody's ability to function in those meaningful activities. So for example, if somebody gets in a car accident and sustains a spinal cord injury, um, and let's say they lose function in their legs and partially in their arms, um, they might need some help being able to get dressed independently, um, you know, prepare their meals, do all of those things on a daily basis that they need to do. Another example, um, since we're talking about stress management today, uh, we know that stress experiences as first responders um, can be really impactful. It can really get in the way of officers uh, being able to do all of the things that they need to do at work and also at home. You know, maybe your level of stress is making it hard for you to focus at work, um, make those last minute split decisions, um, you know, function as a parent at home. Whatever it is, um, stress is a thing that could be interrupting your ability to engage in daily activities. And so an occupational therapist could sit down with you um, and help you figure out how you can overcome those obstacles so that you're still able to do and function in all of the things that you do on a daily basis. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you about how stress can impact your ability to function as an officer and also just as a human being. Um, you know, that stress that you experience on the job can impact you in so many ways. And so we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about how you can experience stress. And then um, with my occupational therapy perspective, I'll talk with you about how we can um, still function uh, by managing our stress and we'll go over you know several different stress management techniques that way you're you're able to do all the things that you want and need to do on a daily basis so the things that we're going to cover today are listed here so we're going to talk about what exactly is stress then we're going to talk about what stress does to us on several different levels so physiologically what it does to our body internally and externally what stress does to us psych psychologically, so what it does to our, our mind and our emotions, um, and also what stress does to our behaviors, how it impacts what we do and how we behave. Then we'll talk about law enforcement stress uh, more specifically, um, because as law enforcement personnel, your stress experiences are definitely unique to those of the general population. Then we'll talk about how we can detect our stress level and understand how it's impacting us. Then we'll talk about sensory preferences, uh, both as a way of understanding our stress level and also as a way of managing stress. Then we'll talk about some other stress management techniques. We'll talk about why it's important to manage stress. Remember, psych always returning it back to our ability to function. So uh, managing stress and how it relates to your job and also just your overall well-being. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with some um, resources that I hope you'll find helpful. So to get started, let's talk about what exactly is stress. And I brought you this very cheesy cartoon. Um, I hope that you get a little chuckle out of it. So according to the latest research, the average human body is 20% water and 80% stress. So stress is something that's very common. It's something that everybody experiences. Um, and we all just experience it in different ways. So uh, moving forward, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what stress does to us um, and how you might be experiencing stress. 
So stress is one way that our bodies respond to the day-to-day -day struggles and demands of life. Some stress is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, if you're walking through the woods and a bear sneaks up on you, you need that stress response so that you can run off to safety. Um, some stress is necessary, but um, often a lot of people experience chronic stress or continued stress, and that excessive amount of stress is, is when we run into some trouble. Um, but some stress can be motivating and protective, so you know maybe you're not coming across bears on a daily basis, but um, maybe you're responding to calls where there is you know something dangerous in front of you, maybe a fight that you need to confront. So you need that stress response to um, be alert and ready to respond. Um, it keeps you safe and trained in your job. Um, so stress it causes our body to flood with hormones such as cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Um, and those hormones prepare your body to either evade, so run away, or confront that danger. Um, so I know that you've spoken with Hannah about the four Fs that, you're, that the stress response causes in you. So fight, so you either confront the situation, flight, uh, you run away, freeze, um, and fornicate. So those are the four F's that come from your stress response. Um, the stress hormones cause the following physical responses in your body. Uh, so you might experience increased blood pressure and pulse rate, heightened muscle preparedness, sweating, alertness, uh, your breathing might speed up, uh, irritable bowel syndrome or um, irritable bowel-like symptoms, Immunity, uh, immune activity decreases and you can begin to get sick more frequently. So all of these physical responses that you're experiencing, what's happening is your brain is telling your body, we need to prioritize right now. There's something in front of me that's a, a threat or is dangerous, so we need to put some things off to the side right now so that I can address this issue. So things like your immune system, you know, when you're confronting a bear, it's not really important if you can, uh, you know, fight off a cold. So that's why your body is prioritizing, you know, what do I need to do right now and what can hold off and wait. Um, so, you know, everything that's beneath the rib cage is needed for imminent survival. So your heart, your lungs, all of that will go into overdrive because you are in, you know, stress is saying there's something in front of me, you know, live or die right now. And then everything below the rib cage is stuff that you don't need for imminent survival. Um, so things in your stomach um, and below, your body will either dump it out or put it on hold. So you might experience, uh, you know, diarrhea or constipation because again, your body is saying, you know, that stuff needs to wait or it needs to get out of here so that I can respond to this stressful, dangerous situation in front of me. Stress can be caused by many different things and something that stresses me might not be something that stresses you. Um, so it's, it's not about comparing our stressors, it's more about figuring out what stresses you out individually and um, becoming aware of what your response to that stress is. Um, so some things I listed here are those more common stressors, um, so maybe family, social conflicts, work demands, a death in the family, um, you know, natural disasters, uh, social media, traffic, news, health, um, food insecurity, uh, work-related stresses, so, you know, responding to fights, weapon calls, traffic stops, day-to-day -day activities of police work, um, critical incidents. Uh, so, again, remember, you know, maybe for your colleague, um, responding to fights doesn't cause them to have a stress response, and for you, that's something that really stresses you out. Um, it's not about comparing, it's just about understanding what stresses you out. The other thing I wanted to point out is um, maybe you have been responding to weapon calls um, for many, many years, and then all of a sudden it's something that is causing a heightened stress response in you. Um, I want you to know that that's, um, that's common. Um, we might be you know, you may have been responding to something or experiencing something for your whole life and it doesn't stress you out and then all of a sudden it might stress you out. 
Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, and so that's why it's really important to become in tune to how your body is responding to stress. That way you can become aware of it because sometimes it's not common sense what stresses us out and our body can be a really good indicator and tool for us to understand uh, when we are experiencing a stress response. So now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about what exactly stress does to us physiologically. So within our body systems um, and also externally how our body feels uh, psychologically, so mentally and behaviorally, so how it affects what we do. Uh, so essentially, depending on your stress level, it's quite possible that stress can impact you in pretty much every aspect of your life. Stress can significantly impact our body internally and externally. Uh, so studies have shown that nearly 75% of all medical complaints are actually stress related, including things like ulcers, stomach disorders, headaches, hypertension, insomnia, aches and pains, and other psychiatric disorders. So stress can really take a toll on our bodies. Um, so one of those stress responses that we talked about was um, tightened muscles. So you're, when you're stressed, your body is tightening and tensing up its muscles because it's getting ready to either fight or run away from a dangerous situation. So that constant state of tightened muscles, if you're experiencing stress for a long period of time, your muscles might be tense for a very long time. And so you could start to experience some aches and pains. Uh, so you might notice that your shoulders are really tight or your neck is always hurting or uh, maybe your hips or knees hurt. So that's something that could definitely be traced back to consistent stress that is not getting managed. Uh, right. So that video we saw exercise is a great stress management technique because that that tenseness in your muscles, your body is responding. And if it doesn't have an outlet to expend that energy, um, it's going to hold on to that tightness. And so that's why you might experience aches and pains. Another thing that you could experience as a result of prolonged stress is brain function decline. So constant stress can actually change the way your brain's neurons are communicating with each other. And it can also actually change the size of your brain. So for example, chronic stress, it can kill brain cells and then it can also shrink the size of your prefrontal cortex. And that's the area of your brain that's responsible for things like your personality development, planning, emotional processing, decision making, memory and learning. So if your brain isn't able to communicate with it with itself and if really important parts of your brain are actually shrinking in size, you're definitely going to experience some pretty significant impact. So your memory might get um, you know, pretty significantly impaired. You might have a hard time focusing. You could have a hard time concentrating. You could have a really difficult time making um, decisions on the spot, which is all of these things are really important for your job. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. And also the constant vigilance um, that you could be experiencing from stress is bad for um, the genes in your brain. And something that's really interesting is if you have kids, uh, you could be passing those um, those genes onto your kids. So that stress you feel, it doesn't just affect you, it could also physiologically impact your children. So that's important to keep in mind as well. And you might hear all that information and hear, you know, how it's happening in your brain and, and think that that's very scary. And, you know, it is, it's definitely a big deal, but the good news is it's not permanent. So those changes that you experience in your brain can be reversed if you learn to manage your stress level, which is really, really great. Our brains are very resilient. So that's the really good news about it all. Um, and so as I said, stress can impact our health overall as well. So not just in our brain and not just in our muscles, um, we could see an, a decline in our health overall. So a compromised immune system, 
remember when our when our body is experiencing a stress response it's prioritizing where the energy is going so things like our immune system that's not a priority when we when our brain is is seeing a danger in front of us so our immune response is getting put off to the side so you could definitely get sick easier and have a harder time healing uh, you could develop ulcers headaches um, declined sexual health stomach disorders so ibs heartburn acid reflux hypertension insomnia psychiatric disorders serious illness and even death so that death, you know, that could come from any of the above. So a decline in your health could just mean overall uh, shorter life expectancy, but you could also be, you're at a higher risk for things like a heart attack. So that those more immediate um, situations could result in death as well. Stress can really greatly impact us psychologically as well. It can impact our mood and it can cause pretty severe emotional fatigue. So if you're constantly feeling stressed out, you might realize that you're becoming um, unable to manage your mood. Maybe you find that you're quick to lose your temper. Maybe you have a hard time communicating. Um, maybe you have trouble sleeping. You might notice also that you're becoming uh, more sensitive to um, the environment around you. So maybe now you're noticing people standing close to you more than ever, or you're noticing the smell of somebody's, um, you know, shampoo. Um, you're noticing the sound of a pen clicking more and it's really irritating you. So that sensory hyper responsiveness could be a result of stress as well. Uh, you could have a very hard time sleeping, increased anxiety, and you could definitely feel um, constantly exhausted. Behaviorally, we're also going to see a big response from stress. And all of this, um, including our last slide, are really all related to the physiological response, right? If, if we're physically feeling really depleted from stress, it's gonna impact our mood and how we behave big time. So uh, when it comes to our behavioral response to stress, um, it could definitely compromise your performance. So if your brain is having a hard time um, communicating with its other cells quickly, you're gonna have a hard time thinking on your feet and being able to respond to those immediate situations in front of you on the job and also personally. It could put you at greater risk for error greater risk for accidents, and it can also impact your relationships. Maybe you're um, having a hard time controlling your mood or your temper, or you're just, you're feeling angry a lot, or really down or anxious. That could impact your relationships. Also, brain imaging studies show that the major language center of the brain can become deactivated in response to traumatic reminders and heightened stress which can actually render you at a loss for words. Um, so that could be impacting your ability to communicate and talk and um, you know, socialize. And so that's another thing that could impact your relationships. Now we're gonna talk about the stress that is more specific to your career. So law enforcement stress in particular. So police work is consistently rated as one of the most stressful jobs worldwide. Uh, and this is something that you don't need me telling you. Uh, you know this, you know, this is what you do on a daily basis. But I just want to acknowledge the unique position that you're in and how it primes you for this chronic stress that you might be experiencing. So as part of your job, you might have uncommon shifts. So you might be working really long hours, maybe um, you know, two days in a row you need to work really long shifts, maybe you're working overnight. Um, either way, these uncommon shifts can really disrupt your routine and your sleep, which can decrease your body's ability to produce chemicals necessary in combating things like depression. Um, it can also disrupt your circadian rhythm, which impacts things like decision-making and judgment. Again, two things that are really important in your line of work. Um, it can also be really difficult for relationships. So not being able to see the people that matter to you and that you care about um, can impact that relationship. And it can also uh, take a toll on your own well-being. You know, it's not fun to not see the people that you care about. Um, and seeing people 
that you care about can be helpful for managing stress. So if you're not able to see them, that's one stress management technique that's kind of out the door. Um, also in your line of work, you are constantly faced with unexpected situations. So the average police officer is experiencing 188 critical incidents in their career. That's a lot. Um, you know, you you never really know when you get a call what you're going to be responding to. It could be something minor. It could be a critical incident. And so that feeling of the unknown and the unexpected uh, might be exciting, but also can take a toll on your level of stress. Um, and so I just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge that these are just a few tidbits of the things in your line of work that can prime you for heightened stress responses. So what do those unique law enforcement related situations do to your physical stress responses? Um, so this slide has a lot of statistics about um, how law enforcement personnel are affected by stress. Um, so I won't go through all of them. I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, so for example, uh, people that work in law enforcement have a higher risk for PTSD, have higher risk for coronary events. Um, you know, in response to that, uh, Congress actually passed in 2003 the Hometown Hero Act that recognized that first responders are at such a high risk for cardiovascular death. Um, and so they made it so that um, a, a heart attack or any other cardiovascular death can be considered a line of duty death. Um, it's a recognition of the fact that the stress you experience because of your job really impacts your health. Um, some other things that are unique to your profession. You are at a much higher risk of suicide um, and that can definitely be linked to the stress that you feel. Um, and another thing is, you know, high cholesterol levels, higher pulse rates. Um, so that chronic stress that you're feeling really takes a toll on your body, both internally, you know, in terms of your, your arteries and your heart, uh, but also in terms of your mind and um, your ability to think and uh, make decisions on the job. So now that I've officially stressed you out about what stress can do to your bodies, um, I want to talk about what we can do about it because there are a lot of things we can do to manage stress. Um, so I hope that you don't find this to be doom and gloom. There are a lot of things we can do to take care of ourselves and now we're going to spend a good amount of time exploring that. In order to manage stress, we first need to be able to detect our own stress level and have a deep understanding of how stress specifically impacts us. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is build some self-awareness. And you can do this in a lot of different ways. This might involve um, you know, talking to others, maybe ask your friends and family, weigh in on what they notice, ask them, you know, after a rough day, what are some things that I usually do? What do you notice and how I behave? Um, it's very possible that you have some pretty, um, pretty significant physical stress responses that you're not even noticing. So having others weigh in on it can be helpful in um, helping you see what your body is doing and how you're behaving in response to stress. Um, another thing that you can do is become aware of your physical responses to prolonged stress. So remember, we talked about how stress can impact us physiologically. So maybe you're experiencing some of that, like headaches, um, gastrointestinal problems, uh, maybe you always have a stomach ache, maybe you're always exhausted, maybe you have back pain, shoulder pain, knee, hip pain, uh, maybe you're having a hard time sleeping. So become in tune to those physical responses and start to think, um, could these be linked to prolonged stress that you're experiencing? Uh, maybe you notice that after, um, you know, after a full week of working, you notice that your body is feeling a lot of these. Or maybe after a really hard day, you, you notice that your stomach hurts like crazy. So start to pick up on those physical responses. 
Also become in tune to how intense and how long they're lasting. How severe is your pain or discomfort and how long is it lasting? Another thing you can do is take stock of how you're using your time. So you can fill out a week long a time log. Um, you can you know, print one out, you can just jot one down, um, but really sit down and think about how, what a typical week looks like for you. And as you're doing that, ask yourself the following questions. How efficient is your use of time? Um, are you finding that it takes you a really long time to just get dressed in the morning or to make a meal? Um, are there particular times during the day where your stress level spikes or dips? You know, jot that down, keep track of that. You might find that there's a particular time during the day where your stress level spikes. And that's important information to know because if, you know, at 2 p.m. every day you get really, really stressed out, then you can start to put some things into your routine that can support you. Maybe at one o'clock you go for a walk or you make sure that you drink a bottle of water or something. You can mix things into your routine to support yourself so that you're able to manage that stress a little bit better. Also ask yourself what activities trigger stress? Which activities calm you down or bring you joy? Um, how is your body feeling at different times of the day? Maybe at, um, I'm gonna pick 2 p.m. again. Maybe at 2 p.m. you notice that your body, uh, your shoulders really hurt at 2 p.m. You know, you really notice that your shoulders are up to your ear and it hurts like crazy. Um, that's important information to know because again, that could be an indicator that at 2 p.m. your stress level is spiking. Uh, maybe I keep picking 2 p.m. because that's what it is for me, but you know, know for yourself, when is it during the day that your stress is spiking? How many hours are you spending sleeping every night? Uh, what is your mood at different times of the day? And you can rate your, your mood on a scale of from one to 10, one being very sad um, and crappy and 10 being happy. Um, so that's important to know as well. Maybe um, the times of the day where you're feeling really, really crappy, that's when your stress level is, is heightened. So that's important to know as well. Um, and the reason why it might be helpful to write out a time log for, for your week, um, a visual can really help you see how you're using your time and how you're feeling throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, and, you know, one of the best ways to support our stress management and our well-being is to mix things into your routine you're way more likely to stick to something and to benefit from it if it's structured into your routine. And when you draw out your week, you know, you might see that you have five minutes on Monday at noon to, um, you know, go for a quick walk or close your eyes and just do some deep breathing by yourself. Um, and those kinds of things can make a big difference in helping you manage your stress. It's also important to become aware of your specific triggers and responses. So this is another one where it can be helpful to consult with other people. You know, ask, ask others what they notice in you after a particularly difficult call. Um, ask uh, how they see you responding. Um, ask what their triggers are and what their responses are, because that can help you think for yourself, um, you know, what is it that triggers my stress response? Um, and how do I respond to those then stress, stressful um, triggers? What does your body tell you and others about your stress? That kind of information is very important to know because it can help us become in tune and aware of our stress response. And then, you know, the more, the more aware we are of our stress responses, the more we're able to manage it, which is really the key. Um, another thing you can do is learn your sensory preferences. So, um, Sensory preferences are, are very important. Um, our brain's source of information comes from our sensory systems. So everything we see, smell, touch, taste, and feel is interpreted by our brains and helps us understand what's going on, um, how we feel, how we should be responding. And each of us has our own unique sensory profile, which I'm gonna talk about a little more in depth on the next slide. 
Um, you know, we all have things that we prefer to smell, that we prefer to taste, um, that, that make us feel good, that make us feel terrible. Like I, for example, hate to be in big crowds because the feel of other people around me is very stressful. Um, I enjoy smelling nice things. Um, I like to see the water. So those kinds of things are, are my, that's my sensory profile. That's what I prefer and that's what helps me feel good. Um, and our sensory preferences can dramatically change with heightened and chronic stress. So we talked about that a few slides back. Um, prolonged stress can make you more or less sensitive to your environment. So that's when you might be more aware of the shampoo that your colleague is wearing. You might be more annoyed by the sound of a pen clicking. Um, so becoming aware of our sensory preferences can be a really useful tool in understanding and managing our stress. So to talk a little bit more about sensory preferences, um, if you look at this slide, there are four different quadrants and um, our unique sensory preferences can um, fall in these within one of these quadrants. And it's not a perfect science, but it's a way of understanding how we are interpreting the sensory experiences around us. So for example, um, that top right quadrant, the seeking area. So that's, um, you know, that's for somebody who needs a lot of input um, to respond. So maybe this is somebody who really likes to attend events with a lot of music. They, they seek a lot of sensory information um, so, you know, loud music, um, food with a lot of tastes, um, you know, socializing with a lot of people, really seeking that sensory information to feel a response. And then if we go down one quadrant, we, we see avoiding. So this might be somebody who is um, always avoiding a lot of sensory input. So this might be somebody who eats um, you know, as a picky eater, they only eat familiar foods, you know, like bland foods with not a lot of flavor, um, or they don't go to events that where there are going to be a lot of people. They like to keep to themselves because a lot of sensory input might make them feel really crappy. If we go to the left one quadrant, we see sensitivity. So this could be somebody who um, startles easily at unexpected or loud noises, um, somebody who has a pretty low threshold for um, sensory information. So, you know, even, even the, um, you know, maybe this is somebody who um, a smell could really, they could register a smell, even, you know, a soft smell could really bother them. Uh, they notice it more. They're very sensitive to things in their environment. Music might feel pretty loud. Um, but the difference between somebody who's sensitive and somebody who avoids, somebody who's sensitive isn't going to actively avoid sensory experiences because, you know, maybe they're sensitive to it, but it's not something that they're actively avoiding. And then if we go up one quadrant to registration, um, this is somebody who needs additional input to respond to stimuli, but they take a passive approach as well. So they don't seem to notice when their face or hands are dirty. They don't really notice when people are standing right next to them. They don't, they need music to be, um, you know, they don't really hear music unless it's really loud. Um, so this is somebody who needs a lot of input to feel or respond. Um, so, you know, I want you to take a minute and look at this slide and think about where do you fall in this quadrant? Um, and um, I'm going to include at the end a sensory preference questionnaire that you can go through to find out, you know, where where do you fall in these quadrants? Because that's useful information. Um, we, we are so used to doing things the way we do them. So sometimes it's helpful to take a step back and think about, um, how you're processing the world around you, because that can be really helpful information for things such as managing your stress. You know, if you know, if you learn that you're really sensitive to information in your environment, you can take steps to um, make sure you're in environments that make you feel good, or you can do things when you're in uncomfortable environments to make yourself feel better. When we talk about sensory preferences, we also have to talk about the different sensory experiences and what they are. 
Most people think that there are five senses, but there are actually seven. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the different senses and hopefully this will get you thinking about which sensory experiences you're more in tune to. And then within the different sensory experiences, um, you know, what your preferences are. So we have sight. Um, so, you know, think for yourself, what kind of things do you like to see? So I really like to see water. So when I'm feeling really stressed out, I like to take a walk. Um, I live in Portland. I like to take a walk down to the, to the bay so that I can see the water. That, that helps me. Um, smell. So what kind of smells calm you down? Which kind of smells make you uh, really irritated? I like the smell of pine, which is why I included that picture on this slide. <laughs> um, touch. So what kind of things do you like the feel of? Um, I included a picture of a dog there because I like to pet my dog. The feel of his fur is a very calming thing for me. Um, taste. So what kind of what kind of foods and flavors do you like to taste? Um, for me, things like chocolate energize me um, and things like um, tea uh, really calm me down. So think for yourself, what are what kinds of things do you taste that make you feel different things? Another sensory another sense um, is sound. So um, you know, for me, I like to listen to calm music when I'm feeling stressed out. If I'm feeling tired, I like to listen to more upbeat music. So think for yourself, what kind of sounds do you like? Maybe you like no sound at all. <laughs> Maybe you have kids and, and silence is something that's very calming to you. Um, and now our last two senses, these are the ones that people, most people don't really know about. Um, so proprioception. This is our body's sense of where we are in space. Um, and vestibular input, this is our body's awareness of movement and balance. Um, so for these, to get proprioceptive input, we can do different things. Um, for me, I like to sleep with a weighted blanket. Um, this gives me proprioceptive input. It helps me feel um, grounded and it helps me feel aware of where my body is and that calms me down. I like to wear you know clothes that have a lot of weight to it say for the same reason it helps me know where my body is in space. So maybe for you that's something that you've never really thought about. Um, and things like yoga uh, while that's movement that's also you know those different positions uh, being inverted um, that can put our body in a different space and that can be something that feels really good for us. Um, and then within vestibular input, that's really any type of movement. So maybe you need to go for a run or, um, you know, go boxing or something like that. Do some kind of movement to feel good or energized or, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, and the other thing that I want to talk about is the fact that different sensory experiences um, during traumatic events can serve as triggers and can change your sensory preferences. So, for example, um, let's say you're dispatched to a scene and um, maybe there's a really strong smell and it's a really, uh, a really traumatic call. There's a lot going on. Um, and it's really it's it's a really horrible, stressful scene. And that smell can become associated with that really traumatic experience. So later on, when you smell um, that same scent from that scene, it could trigger a stressful response, even if that smell was, you know, something you liked in the past. You know, maybe it's the smell of pine. Um, you know, that smell could serve as a trigger. And so that can change. Um, your sensory preferences. So it's important to be in tune to that. And if that's something that happens to you, you know, don't beat yourself up about it, but use that as a tool to manage your stress. Some other things that we can do to manage our stress uh, beyond just understanding our sensory preferences, um, we can also do things like set goals for ourselves. Make your goals short term, measurable, achievable, something that you can you can do within a short period of time. So, for example, um, by the end of the week, I'll exercise for 30 minutes on at least two days of the week. 
that's a short-term goal that you can achieve within one week um, and that kind of thing you know exercise is a great uh, stress management technique so you can start mixing in different stress management techniques by setting these short-term goals that you can really achieve um, another thing you can do is socialize so um, spend time with people that make you feel good um, with people who are good at managing stress so you can learn from them um, that's important play you know play with your kids play board games maybe you can join an intramural sports team um, leisure activities so that's really important when uh, back a few slides ago when we talked about looking at your week and how you occupy your time are you doing anything in your week for yourself that makes you feel good that's a leisure activity you know are you playing any sports are you um, doing things that make you feel good make sure you're mixing those into your week put them into your schedule make it a routine set it as a goal that way you're actually giving it a try so that you can benefit from it exercise is very very uh, you know over and over again studies have showed that exercise is one of the best ways to manage stress um, when we are feeling stressed out our bodies are in that heightened response our muscles are tense we have all of this energy and if we don't find a way to expel it uh, such as with exercise we're gonna still hold on to it and then that's when our bodies deteriorate so exercising is really great it's um, it's good for expelling that energy so that your cortisol levels can go down so that your body leaves that stress response Exercise can also serve as a just of, as a distraction technique. So it can help you um, think about something else other than the thing that stresses you out. Meditation is another thing that is constantly cited as one of the most powerful stress management techniques. And I know for me, when I first started hearing meditation, my I have a gag reflex to it. Um, but then I started to explore it a little bit more and meditation can be more than just sitting cross-legged with your eyes closed um, Meditation can be a lot of different things. It's about um, It's not just about emptying your mind. That's that's not what it is It's about training your brain to return to the present moment to become aware of where you are right now and how your body is feeling so when you think about it like that, it's it's really an exercise for your brain. And you can do it in a lot of different ways. You can do it while walking. You can do it while sitting, while laying in bed. Um, and training your brain to return to the present moment is such an incredibly helpful skill. If you're constantly stressed, your mind is wandering all over the place to those stressful scenarios. And if you're able to train your brain to come back to the present moment, to where you are and to how you feel, then you can take some deep breaths and calm down and focus on the, the present moment. Um, and things like yoga, which combine exercise and meditation, are you know just the best of both worlds. So um, you know, moving your body in a way that involves deep breathing, right? Yoga is about deep breathing and awareness of, of our body. Um, and it is also a mindfulness practice. That's a really great way to get at both. So, you know, using your body, expelling that energy and also training your mind to return to the present moment. Um, there's no shame in practicing meditation. Um, Strengthening your brain to return to the present moment is one of the best skills that you can develop to combat stress. Another thing you can do is spend some time in nature, you know, eat good foods so that you can strengthen your immune system. Remember, that's one of those things that gets depleted with chronic stress. Um, keep your body healthy. Um, you know, digestive health is something that goes out the door with a lot of stress and nutrition can help with that peer support, talk therapy, group therapy, medication. There's lots of different things you can try to manage your stress. So step one, become aware of your stress. And then step two, we want to try out different things to manage our stress. Why is it important to manage stress? Um, so you have chosen a career that's incredibly stressful. Um, this is something that's widely known and understood. Um, you know, and if you, you know, you if you believe in the work that you do and you want to have longevity in it, you need to build the skills to become aware of your stress 
so that you can develop some successful stress management techniques. That way your health and well-being, professional skills, social life, personal life don't suffer. We want you to be able to do your job and to feel good and live a good life. And so managing your stress is very, very important. And back to, you know, being able to do the things in your daily life that are important to you. Um, if you're constantly stressed out and you're only going to work and then sitting at home feeling stressed out, you're not going to be able to, to have a good balance and to do those things that are important to you. So stress management work is really helpful and can and really make sure that you're able to have a life filled with things that are important to you. Um, here I've included some resources for you. I've included a sensory profile so that you can fill out this questionnaire, figure out what your sensory preferences are. That can be very helpful. Um, I've included some NAMI main officer specific resources. Um, so links to a list of clinicians who are trained specifically to work with law enforcement, uh, law enforcement trained peer support. Um, I've also included some links for yoga that's specific for first responders. So it's for first responders. It has first responders in the videos. I definitely recommend it. Um, first responder meditation. Again, this is uh, these are guided meditations that are free and that are specific for first responders. And then you can also check out phone apps. Uh, there's a lot that can be really helpful, such as um, some breathing apps. Uh, so I, I listed some names there for you as well. To review, we talked about what stress is, what it does to our bodies, physiologically, psychologically, behaviorally. Uh, we talked about stress that's specific to law enforcement. Uh, we talked about how we can detect our stress level and understand how it's impacting us, um, which is very, very important. And becoming in tune to your physical responses to stress is really key for opening up an understanding of how we respond to stress and how we can manage it. Sensory preferences as a self-awareness tool and a stress management technique. Learn how you process the environment and how you can use the environment to your advantage. Uh, we talked about other stress management techniques and why it's so important to manage stress. So one more time, just to reiterate, you've chosen a career that's incredibly stressful um, and studies have shown that stress can lead to some really poor health outcomes for you all and so it's important for you to take advantage of the many stress management techniques available to you so that you don't have to suffer from those health consequences and so that you're able to do a really good job at work and also have a, a fulfilling life outside of work. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I hope that you found it helpful and informative. Um, thank you so much for the work that you do and please take advantage of the stress management techniques available to you. Uh, we want you to be healthy and well. That way you can continue to serve and protect your communities. Thank you very much.